Dave Hodgson. The Daily. John Carter Bush, Kate, the inside the rainbow. It's the brother of Kate Bush. He's joining me. He's a photographer, professional photographer, and he's uh, been photographing his sister uh, all her career and much more as well. And the book is really amazing stuff. So we're going to be talking to him about Kate and about his photography of her. John Carter Bush, Kate Bush's sister, on the show today. We're talking Kate Bush in a few minutes' time on TRE. Talk Radio Europe. Your voice in Spain. Dave Hodgson, The Daily. OK, heading over to the UK, uh, John Carter Bush is on the line talking about Kate Inside the Rainbow, the new book. Good afternoon. How are you, John? Yeah, pretty good, thanks. And you? Yes, not bad at all. Thank you very much. Good. Um, this, I, I said this to you off air, and I'll say it again on air, that uh, we get quite a few books on this show, and I've got to say that this is probably one of the most stunning productions i've ever come across and i I don't say that lightly it really is uh, it's a weighty book it's a it's a big book it's atmospheric it's uh, it's just very very well made so uh, all, all credit due there yeah, well, great that you like it. I mean, it's, it's been 30 years in the making, so, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot in there. Uh, well, of course, I mean, there's some fun... I mean, the photography is just absolutely awesome, and, of course, it will be, your passion for photography comes across. Um, but this started from a, a very early age, your love of taking photos and, and Kate's love, I suppose, of posing for photos. Yeah, I, I, I started taking photos in my late teens, early 20s, and uh, I used Kate, who was only, what, six, seven at that age, um, as my main model. Um, and yeah, we had a lot of fun doing photographs at that time. And then when her career started up, I became involved in taking photographs of her as a rock star. Is she a bit of a natural in front of the camera then? Was that, did you see that in her from an early age? You know, I don't think I did. <laughs> I mean, looking back, when you look back at the photographs of her when she was eight or nine, you can see it. Yeah. But certainly at the time, I mean, she was just my little sister, and we had no <laughs> idea what was going to happen in the future. So, you know, I mean, I could see she came out well in the photographs, but I couldn't see star quality or anything like that. No, well, you, you, not, not, not family members find it difficult to see that, don't they, as well? Because they, 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 see, they see the annoyances as well. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, when, you, when you're living with somebody all the time, you just don't pick up on that stuff. And, and of course, I mean, the, obviously the book is the photography, but you do focus on, on Kate's career in there and how uh, it really, she came uh, in, well, came on the scene, really, uh, at, a, at a time when it was, the music she was coming out with was very different to the mainstream stuff. Yeah, that's, that's very true. And I think uh, the impact of Wuthering Heights <laughs> when it was first released was, was quite enormous. And um, it involved us all, really. None, none of us were really expecting something like that to happen. So the family sort of um, gathered in behind her as, as a support mechanism. Uh, and also, I'm wondering whether it, it was almost like a time when, uh, as I'm reading about her, that it was a time when really th- there needed to be something fresh coming along. Obviously, progressive rock was really big at the time, and uh, she just kind of brought a bit of freshness to uh, something that was been around for a long time. Yeah, I think that that's true. But also, you, you've got to remember that uh, punk and the Sex Pistols have been going you know, for a couple of years just before this. And for her kind of music to suddenly make a breakthrough in that point of time, I think is really interesting because you would have expected it to be more a continuation of punk, a very more obviously rebellious sort of music um, against you know, the 20 or 30 years of, of pop music before punk. And for her to sort of come in with, well, I was going to say quality music, it certainly is, but something that was so different and was successful, is re- I think, is really interesting. What was it like there in your family then? Uh, I, I was reading you were brought up Roman Catholics and uh, you, that actually your family were quite uh, creative anyway, so you, you come from a creative background. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, well, our parents weren't uh, particular. I mean, my father was in his late teens, was writing um, songs. But he went on to become a doctor and a practicing GP, and he threw so the creative side away. You don't want GPs to be too creative. Do well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he put all that aside. He played the piano a lot, but, I mean, he didn't ever see himself yeah. having any other kind of career. And then my brother, he was, uh, at that stage, he was making musical instruments, 
Um, and I was involved with poetry readings and things like that. So yeah, yeah, you could say it was a, a kind of a nest bed of creativity. So that's your brother Paddy, and he plays quite a lot of instruments, is that right? Oh, he does. He's a multi-musician. I mean, he pops up on all, all of Kate, most of Kate's albums, playing various sorts of music, but his main... Um, interest is Madagascan music at the moment, has been for the last 10-15 years and uh, he used to go over to Madagascar quite a lot and it's done quite a lot to get Madagascan music more out into the um, world music scene. Yeah. Uh, and what about yourself when it comes to music? Well, I, <laughs> from my late teens into my middle 20s I had a couple of folk bands, which interestingly, I mean, uh, Kate used to come and sing along when we were rehearsing but she was very small when she was doing that. And my brother Paddy was in those bands too. But um, I sort of gave that up in my middle 20s and uh, applied myself more seriously. I was, I was um, studying the law at the time, so uh, that was taking up most of my time. And then a bit later on, I gave up the law and started to try and focus on writing. And uh, so when my early 30s came along, uh, suddenly Kate's career was there and I found myself uh, going back into um, playing and being a lawyer in a sense, which was very useful because as, as you know, the music scene, anything, you've got publishing contracts, yeah. recording contracts. So um, my experience in the law was very useful. Well, I was going to ask you about that because uh, reading about Kate, she seems to be somebody that knows what she wants and uh, in a creative way, which is fantastic, and rather than just be a kind of a, a, a donkey for the music industry. She she even said which song she wanted to come out to be released first, which was Wuthering Hearts, Wuthering Hearts, her number one single in the UK. So she, she had quite a lot of say at the time. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it was difficult for the record company in those days to... Uh, they didn't really know how to handle Kate, to be quite honest, and I think her determination uh, was what won through. But I think it had always been there. I mean, right from the time when she started writing songs, um, so we're looking at 11, 12, um, she had a very clear idea of uh, what she was doing and where she wanted those to go. I mean, I don't think she saw herself as having a career at that stage, but certainly later, when she got to 18, 19, 20, and it was all starting up, um, there was a determination there. She knew that it was her music and her art she wanted to go out into the world and not really herself. Yeah, uh, which doesn't always happen, does it, as we know. But uh, with, with her music being so unique and eclectic, I suppose, is the word, uh, and that's what people love about it, it's just uh, different, you know, to what you would heard, hit, certainly what you would have heard before in the charts. Um, it's difficult for me to see as somebody from an outsider where her musical inspiration came from. Was it a folky type of area or country? Or I, I think it was, uh, it was definitely, there was a lot of folk music being played, but there was also a lot of rock and jazz and um, classical. I mean, my father's influence came on the classical side because he played the piano a lot for, for his own pleasure, and that was nearly all classical music. Although, uh, specifically, I suppose, if he'd been asked what he really liked, it would have been the music of the 40s and the early 50s. Um, that was coming from American songwriters, which would have been the music of his, of his teens. And... Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there were, no, there were lots of things going on in the house. So, I mean, I don't think... If there was anything that would be um, a common pulling it all together, was was it good? So we were listening to good music of all different types, folk, rock, pop, classical, jazz. It's a, it's a great, rich place to be, isn't it, when you, when you can dip into genres and just uh, appreciate the best of each. Like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah, and I, th I think, you know, we were very open-minded. It was If it was good, we liked it. And certainly that was a, a, must have been an influence on Kate, I mean, um, because it was around her as, as she was growing up. So uh, I, I was reading also that, you know, EMI kind of signed her up, kind of seeing something in her, uh, even though she was still at school getting her O-levels and so on, and... Um, that kind of kept her in that contract, but it wasn't long before she wanted to kind of do her own thing and have her own music business herself. Yeah, I mean, she she's been with EMI a long time, and certainly in those, as happens with any artist, when you first start out, uh, you don't have much control over anything. And I think within the first two or three years of her relationship with the major record companies, um, she actually carved a niche in which she said, well, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm not going to do 
particularly what you say. And if you know you want me to keep making records, then you're going to have to go with me. And of course, uh, the music and the quality of it was such that um, I think they they tended to let her sail after a while under her own steam, rather than dictating what they thought was good for her. Yeah. You alluded to this earlier, and this is something I suppose that really comes across in her, and you said it art, uh, you know, because there'll be people out there who, and, and I know nowadays there's so much more to it than just singing a song, but uh, she kind of came along in an era where uh, photographing and art and album covers were starting to become really, really the part of the, the package, I suppose. Uh, and it seems that she saw the, the, it was an art to it, it as a creativity. She was. She was working on so many different aspects, the, the imagery and also the actual sound of the music and, and all the, the full package. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, it would specifically start with trying to control uh, the projection of an image in still photographs, and then that moved on to video because she was really at the beginning of, um, well, the fashion for making videos to go with pop music. Um, and yeah, if, but at the same time, if you, if you really think about it, videos as such didn't get a great deal of uh, airplay no. on television and you could spend an absolute fortune making a video and it might not even be shown anywhere. This was sort of pre-MTV. Yeah. And I think it's only kind of in the last couple of years that video has really worked for um, people working in the music scene with um, the internet. The YouTube. The I, YouTube. I think I'm yeah. right in saying it's something in the back of my head from a pub quiz, uh, John, it's telling me that Elvis Jailhouse Rock was possibly the first music video, but I might be wrong there. <laughs> Uh, well, it's only as a film, yeah. It would have probably would have been. I, I don't know. Was it ever taken out as a clip and shown individually? That's a really interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, somebody will let us know, possibly. Uh, and so, looking at all of that, she she is the full package. She, I mean, she learned to dance, and uh, and without sounding too offensive, her dance wasn't conventional in the way in which the rest of everybody was dancing at the time. Yeah, it was I know different. That- that is also a, a really interesting aspect, which I think it's only now people are picking up on this, of actually how good a dancer she was um, in you know, the first 20 years of her career when she was using dance a lot to express the music. And people are looking at it and now, and at the time it was thought as being pretty quirky, but a lot of people are looking back at it and saying, well, actually, that was really good in terms of modern dance. And you can see how in, you know, the, at the front wave of that style of modern dance she really was uh, and going talking about the photography let's talk a little bit about the book for a final few minutes um was she you said earlier on when she was younger she's quite happy to pose there and uh, it, was she happy posing in front of the camera or was she one of these people like me maybe come on can you get on with it you know i want to go <laughs> <laughs> well it depends how far we go back if we go back to the first time when she you know when, when she was eight nine ten she just did it because uh, i asked her to and i mean i don't really think um she was that bothered either way and i think as time went on uh, initially when she first started having photographs taken for her related to her career i think that was you know that wasn't difficult but that was another interesting area she didn't have any experience of and then bit by bit she learned how to project um what she wanted to see in a photograph which is i think that's the skill of any artist who's photographed a lot it doesn't matter who it is whether it's kate or madonna or whatever is knowing what that photograph is going to look at when it's being taken so you know it's it's a kind of pre-visualization of the final product and i think she got that skill very quickly and it's a skill that she worked on and certainly for me um the photographs i took of her in the middle 80s uh, were the ones that really showed how that there was an actress in there as well yeah (laughs) that projection um she she really mastered that how much is the emphasis on the person then? You, you, you kind of alluded to it there, sitting there. Because you, you look at great people of the past who are iconic now, and you'll see them in restaurants still today. Elvis, Marilyn Monroe, photog- you know, photographed so many times, getting used to being photographed and projecting themselves. How much is it down to that individual artist to do that, or the actual photographer to draw it out of them? I think it's, it's, it's to start off with, it's got to be both. I think nobody really comes in with that skill of projection. Um, they can be photogenic, and which, which case, you know, there's no effort required. But as time goes on, 
they start to recognize which photos of them that have been taken that work, and then they can start to use that. And if you take an extreme version, like uh, Marlena Dietrich, for instance, uh, when she had photographs taken of her, every single aspect of the lighting was controlled by her, the makeup that was used, that kind of thing, to a very fine detail, because she knew that would produce the photograph that she wanted, but also that everybody else wanted. I mean, I don't think Kate was ever at that extreme as Marlona Dietrich, but certainly um, that is a skill. And yeah. they start to recognize whether the lights are going to work, for instance. Uh, I'm finding it fascinating because I'm starting just to kind of get into photography a little bit myself. Uh, and as, as we see now, even in the midst of this YouTube age that we live in, um, a photograph still carries so much. But we've seen it this summer. We've seen the poor immigrants on the beach. We've seen the photo of the young boy being taken from the sea, which changed a lot of policies and, and kind of brought the news agenda alive on that a story. And it's one, and we've seen story, photograph after photograph that's brought news stories alive, you know, the Tiananmen Square, that sort of... Yeah. Um, and even in the midst of this 24-hour news on YouTube, it's amazing, isn't it, that a photograph still brings that power across, that conveys a story. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> I mean, the still image still sells. I mean, despite everything, whether it's news broadcasting or video or whatever, it will always be the still image that does it. And I think it's because in that split instant, something is caught. If you're seeing it moving and before and after, it doesn't have the same power. If yeah. you as a viewer have the time to sit there and look at it and absorb it, and it sends something at you as you look at it, and you're sending something back to the photo, it's a much more intimate experience that feels so much more personal than if you're watching a film or a video, which, of course, can have a strong impact. But I still think the still photograph rules... <laughs> And, and there's this tension with, uh, with photographers. Because you, there must be times when you uh, pull your hair out uh, um, because are there not times when you can have the right studio setting, the right lighting, the best makeup artist, the best hairstyling, all the right things in the right place and it just doesn't happen and then there are other times when you catch somebody off guard and it's a fantastic photograph? Yeah, I think that those two things are certainly part of it. And the latter one of just having to catch it is probably in many ways the most satisfying one because you know that can never be caught again yeah. um, with the studio photograph that depends really on how professional the person is you're photographing and if they know that it's important this is an important moment then they'll project and you'll get something from it now you've uh, been doing some more photography recently with Kate because uh, whereabouts are we with her career at the moment how's she getting on I mean she's doing very well of course that sounded really bad <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think if, if we go back to 2011, I was taking photographs of her suddenly again for two albums she released that year. So, I mean, this was, nobody really expected it. And then just when you think it's all going to sleep again, bang, last year we've got the live show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think this is, this is the great thing about Kate. You never know what's coming next. And at the same time, that body of work never goes away. So even you go right back to her first album, it's still out there, and there's still people who are listening to that for the first time now. So, like, popular music in that sense is in its own time sphere that floats in the ether. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where you are in time. It, it, it isn't a time-related thing. You can always go back to it. And, of course, there's a massive volume of work there by her that, that people can just get in there and mine. Is Kate surprised when she puts on this show like she did last year in London and places like that and sells out a concert? Is she surprised by that still? Yes. Yes, I think this is, this is one of the charming aspects of her, um, is, in a sense, is modesty. I don't think she's ever seen herself as anything unusual or different. You know, she does her work, and she does it, and she puts it out, and then suddenly people love it. I mean, I, there isn't that feeling that, well, I'm doing something now that everybody's going to like. It's not like that at all. And I think the reaction to the shows, which was phenomenal, and, and you know, quite rightly so, because they were, they were so really an exciting experience to go along to one of them. Um, I, th I think she's just amazed that people <laughs> like it so much. I, I think with, with Kate Bush, uh, I mean, obviously I've, I've loved loads of different types of music, uh, if you, even if you don't like her music so much and you, your taste is somewhere else, you still kind of respect the fact that she's produced this 
and, and herself and she'd been creative and if I'm right in remembering she was the first woman to reach number one uh, having penned her own song yeah. um, and you know and Ivan Novella of course uh, recognising her contribution to, uh, to British music I think most people will respect the fact that she has done it her way to quote Sinatra yeah I think this is true and more and more so as time goes by particularly with um, women artists now uh, most of whom will look back to her as an influence. Doesn't matter what age they are. You know, you can you can hear people in their early twenties who are chart successes talking about the influence Kate's had on them, and I find that you know really wonderful. But I think it is. It's not just the music. You're right. It's that package of of, of the woman artist who is completely con- in control of the output of her art, and that that's not so unique these days. But certainly when she started, it was. Now, we've got this fantastic book here, Kate. Normally, I would say, because we're talking about small paperbacks, that you can order it on Amazon. I don't know how much it will cost on Amazon because of the weight and uh, shipping it into Spain. Uh, But I'm sure if you've got folks coming across from the UK before Christmas, it would make a great present for somebody. Ask them to bring it across with them. Uh, I've got a copy in my hands, and I think we're going to stick it in our auction for a cancer hospice here. Um, So that'll be good. Um, So all good. Now, finally, before you go, John, I know we've had you on a while. I just wanted to ask you, uh, somebody I, I'm starting to get into photography. I've, all I've got is a, a, um, a 6 million pixel camera, a Samsung, a, just a standard one, and an iPhone 6. Tell me, does it cost a lot to start off in photography and how much do you really kind of need to get yourself going? Well, I mean, what you've got is, is a pretty good start. <clears throat> and it depends what you want to do with the photographs. If you want to just keep them in your computer or on your phone, where you are is good enough. If you want to move on to something else like them being reproduced in newspapers or you want to make prints of them then you've got to think of of, of more of moving up more and costing more but here is a warning yeah if i look at the hasselblad equipment that uh, i use to take uh, my favorite photos of kate i suppose the whole lot probably cost me about 1500 pound then if i was to replicate that now i'd be spending nearly a hundred thousand pound and you've still got the same equipment? I've still got the same house of blood and, and all the lenses that went with it, yeah. Good but, stuff. I mean, yeah. But, but I do, you know, most of the time I'm using digital now yeah. because it's so much easier to work with. You don't need any chemistry or anything like that. But it, it really is what do you want to use the photos for? And if you want to get into a professional area, then you've got to expect to be spending more money. And, but, you know, a good starting area probably for semi-professional would be around the thousand to fifteen hundred pound mark right okay i'll better get saving there thank you yeah. very much john <laughs> as all thank you for joining us and we wish you all the best with the book and uh, just hope that it's uh, that it uh, help blesses a lot of people i'm sure it will thank you very much great thanks lovely to talk to you and you bye-bye yeah. bye <laughs> Radio Europe, your voice in Spain.